Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome to VCs at UCD, Venture Capitalists at UC Davis. It's a pleasure to have everyone joining us today. So anyway, my name is Aaron Anderson. I am the director of the Student Startup Center here at UC Davis, and I've been working with startups for a number of years myself. Um, but it is my pleasure today to introduce you to Chan Tang, the founding partner of the UC Berkeley Skydeck Fund. Um, one of the most active and impressive early stage investors in the whole of Silicon Valley and making investments into companies coming from around the world. Um, but I don't want to steal Chan's intro. I want him to tell his story. Um, so, but, but maybe we'll do this a little bit chronologically. So Chan, you're, you're a Davis native, grew up here. Um, can you tell us kind of your early career story, you know, university experience, first jobs and, and, the goal here is to figure out how in the world you got into venture capital in the first place. Absolutely. Before I get into that, speaking of, chron chron of, of uh, doing this chronologically, it's fun to mention how I met Aaron. I'm not sure if you remember Aaron, but back in 2016 or so, um, I, I, I had a not so great idea for um, a startup that I wanted to launch and, and, and I wanted uh, someone to help me build, build this thing. And I asked around and someone put me towards Aaron and I brought him in. We had a conversation. He, he heard my pitch and he kind of said, that's a bad idea. And you know what? He, he was right. He was right. So, um, but it, it's interesting. It's great to see all the uh, great work that you now do on campus and I'm more than happy to be here. Um, so uh, my background um, is in tech. Uh, I, I uh, uh, got my bachelor's in EECS from Berkeley, a bunch of grad school at MIT immediately following. The most important part of that, that part of my life is that I really came of age in the original dot-com era. So I got my master's in 98, um, and then I left the PhD program in 2000, actually, because it was really the height of the bubble. And there was so much excitement and so much fervor. And, you know, it, it's not like uh, for all of you who have, got, who, have got, who have gone through the Bitcoin era, who've lived through what happened with GameStop, you know, you guys got a, a taste of that. But what you also had in the last two or three years were a lot of folks like me and perhaps Aaron saying, well, this isn't going to last. You know, we've seen this before. We've seen this movie. It's not going to go pretty. And, and I'm sure we will be wrong occasionally, but in these two cases, most of us were probably right, right? We knew that these were bubbles. Go back 20 years, in 98 and 2000, no one really knew that that was a bubble. You know, in the original bubble, um, I, I really felt, felt convinced and really industry as a whole had no frame of reference. All we knew is that there was this great new concept called the internet that was changing the world. Um, we had things like e-commerce, we could buy things online now, we could buy groceries online. Every business model imaginable seemed disruptive, seemed like it could work, um, and no one, no one could possibly know better. Uh, so I, I, I certainly ate that up. Um, I decided to build my own startup. Um, it was very compelling because it, it, was, it was actually uh, my co-founding team consisted of me um, coming from, from grad school and someone from H, HBS, um, and we felt like we were kings of the universe, right? And um, uh, it was very easy to point to other companies I had raised and say, hey, if those guys are worth, you know, $5 million, $10 million, or easily worth 20, because those guys also had um, a PowerPoint, a story, and not a whole, whole lot more. That's what we had. Uh, of course, once I left and came out to the Valley and, um, uh, and actually tried to build our business and fundraise. That was exactly when the bubble burst. And it turned out that if those companies were worthless, our company was also worthless. Um, so, so there was a, a lot of, uh, I would say, pain and trauma um, from that moment in my life. Um, and, and that's something that I really want to really convey to founders as well, um, for all of you who are thinking about going down that, that pathway. Um, I'm actually quite pleased that I had that failure early in my life. It was a devastating time in my life. I went through, I don't know, three months plus where I didn't want to talk to anybody. I, I was holed up in my room because it really felt like a personal failure. And it was the first personal failure in my life. If you think about the kind of person that, 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 um, that wants to 
that leave school to do a startup, right? And I think it applies to a lot of you. It applies to a lot of our peers. These are folks who have not failed in life before, right? And they did well in, in, in high school. That's how they got into a good college. And that's how they got into a good grad school. And if they wore it, they've, they've had a great career so far. That's what inspired them to believe, to have the confidence to, go to, to want to go out and go do this thing. So the moment that you face that, that, that failure, for me, it was a massive gut check. It made me question everything in my life. And it made me wonder if I wanted to ever go, go back into, into this world and face that pain again. But of course, a few years later, uh, the pain faded. I realized that my love for entrepreneurship and, and early stage, um, it didn't fade. In fact, it was, I would say, increased by that experience. I realized that there was not scary. Everywhere I looked, I, the thought going through, I would walk into a restaurant and, and the thought would be, hey, what could I do to make this place better, right? What could I do to disrupt how this place is, is run? Um, so with that in the back of my mind, only about five, six years later, I was back as a angel investor. Um, I walked in not expecting a whole lot. I was just wanted, I just loved the action so much that even though I didn't have a great idea for a business that I wanted to build, I wanted to see what was out there. I wanted to invest in it. Um, fast forward, I had been an angel investor for about 12 years. Uh, I made about 36 investments in that time frame, uh, almost all exclusively early stage, pre, pre products, pre revenue, just folks that had a PowerPoint and a vision and a dream. Um, professionally, I was, I was actually a quant fund manager. Um, so because I had a background in, in um, quant finance and also because I, I was at, at this point, I had seen and joined and participated in early stage formation, it was very easy to say, hey, I'm gonna go build a quant fund. Um, I, I did that for about six plus years, enjoyed it, made some money, um, but it was certainly not my vision for, it was not my passion. Um, uh, that, that, that brings me back to, so post 2014, I walked away from that. Um, I actually lived in China for a couple of years um, where I built a venture back company. So got a little more experience on the founder side there. Um, been back in the US, uh, not including right now, because as Aaron knows, I'm actually back in China as we speak because of COVID um, and our kids are, 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 are currently enrolled in school out here. But professionally, I've been back in the US since 2015 or so. And um, uh, basically a full-time professional angel investor. Um, I had been in every accelerator uh, in California. That's how you get your deal flow. That's because there are thousands of companies. Thousands of companies weren't gonna send their pitch decks to me as Sean. Um, but by pairing myself up with angel groups in Sacramento and San Francisco and LA and, and, uh, and uh, beyond, I could get access to thousands of companies. And that's how I made 20 plus investments in one year. Uh, and one of them was of course, the one that I'm, I'm at currently at Berkeley. Um, and uh, it, this was an accelerator that had been around for a while. I wanted to be involved. Uh, and about a year into that experience, they found out about my fun, fundraising experience and said, hey, sure, it would be great if there was a way to build a venture fund. And that brings us into chapter two. Awesome. And I'll pause about there. Yeah. So, so, I mean, my, my goodness, we, we blew through like a million things here that are just all impressive <laughs> so resume weird. bullets uh, in and of themselves. Yeah. Um, I want to part for just a second on this idea of failure. Um, and, you know, you said that, you know, many peers never had failed before. And I want to, I want to hear a little bit more about what you learned from failure, how you picked yourself up from it. And, and maybe, maybe what would be really interesting is like, a lot of what happened to you, it sounds like, was bad timing. You know, launch a company and the bubble bursts and kind of underneath you. Um, what did you learn from failure in terms of things that were in your control and you could do better and how to manage things that are maybe totally beyond your control? Yeah, I think the most important, because, because obviously, um, I'm not sure that I would say that my failure was due exclusively to, um, to, to the timing. Um, in hindsight, we were... It was a bad idea in a bad market. And we as founders were not ready. 
Okay. Um, what I and I would say that every failure that I've, I've had since and I've had quite a few has failed for different reasons. So I'm not sure that there's a single um, rule of the road here that I can give folks and say, if you do this, you're, you're not gonna fail. I, I think as long as we pursue a venture as a career, as an industry, we just have to accept that failure is not only possible, it's probable, right? I mean, I, all of you have seen the data. I've certainly seen it in my portfolio. The number of founders that walk away from, from their venture happy is a minority. The majority will walk away feeling like they invested the last three years, five years, eight years of their lives, um, and it was not the right choice, right? So that's a scary feeling. But what, what I would say, what I learned from my failure early on, and, and I hope all, all, all of you get is that failure is not the end of the world. It, it, it's really not, you know, we're very fortunate. It, it, and now this is something that's very cultural, um, by virtue of what I'm doing now, I, I, I see startups from around the world and startup ecosystem from around the world. And, and on many parts um, in other countries, you have a startup ecosystem where there's true consequences if you attempt to leave your corporate job, if you leave uh, your PhD program um, to form a, a, a company that, that, that then fails. There are consequences. Your, your family, um, are, they're bummed. They're, they, are, they, they feel like they've invested in you and, and, and now you, you, you've lost your, your uh, career. Um, your, your friends are, are questioning you, they're mocking you, right? Uh, I guess those aren't great friends, but all of us have those people in, in, in our lives. Um, your, uh, your, your previous job, your previous bosses are, and, and your previous careers might not be available anymore. Like that's a reality. Here in, in the US, but especially in California, it's a different world, right? All of you understand that when you tell your friends and your classmates, um, and I hope all of your parents, like, hey, I'm, I'm gonna go build a company right now. People tend to be very encouraging. In fact, they think it's really cool. Right, which is a different story because it actually inspires some people who might not be the best founders in terms of their, their willingness to tolerate pain um, to, be, to be a founder. But, but the point is the consequences, the emotional personal con consequences of taking this risk is quite low. People will be behind you and they want you to thrive. And you have people like Aaron here, right? He's here to, to show, you, show you the way and, and, and he's there to give you help and advice and, and more. Professionally, doing a startup in, in California is also very low risk. No one's gonna see this line item on, on your LinkedIn or on your resume and, and kind of go like, oh, well, this guy, you know, he's no good. He had two, two years away from a corporate job. What's his, what's his website that, that he built? I mean, that's not a thing. Um, instead, you're much more likely to be employable and backable just because you built a company. When I see a founder pitching who's failed, she's failed twice, three times before, and she's back for her fourth company, that's great. I, I, I find that extremely exciting because I, I know she's learned a lot in that process. So embrace failure. I love this idea of, um, it's almost like de-risking, right? You know, entrepreneurship is super risky, but if you put yourself in an environment where maybe we're talking about your career as opposed to the company you're founding, but you're de-risking the consequences, um, it just strikes me as extremely wise. Um, well, John, one more question about your early career, and then we'll really get into the meat and potatoes here. Um, but so you were founding relatively early in your career, you know, left a, left a, a degree program. Um, any general thoughts about the idea of founding young, you know, while working on a degree or even walking away from a degree pro program, would you recommend it, discourage it, or, or how would you think about any given situation? I think within certain parameters, I'm absolutely a fan of it and I encourage it. Um, I think startups are, are um, entrepreneurship is not something that's easily taught um, and it's not gonna be e easier for you at 30 just because you're now at, at, at 30. Um, I think all of us, there's obviously lots of great examples in history when you, when you be at Facebook or Microsoft or, or Dell or, or, or a thousand more, more 
uh, companies that, that all of us see around us. Folks are building billion dollar businesses that change, change the world from their dorm rooms. Um, so the, the possibility is, is absolutely there. Um, and, and I encourage all of you to consider it. Now, the parameters that I mentioned is that um, many college students um, that are young, the one thing that they lack is not the ability to build a start. I, I, I think all of you have that inherent um, inside you. I think the real risk is that they don't know much of the world at large. Their, their problem set is very small, right? They, um, all of us can only build companies to solve problems and pain points that we are aware of. And that seems pretty obvious, um, but just understand that that, that means um, the businesses that, that a lot of students I see trying to create are not very interesting, right? If, if, if I could count, I mean, probably 50% of the startups that I see coming from a current undergrad is inevitably around either food delivery or dating or something around, you know, like, making dorm life more, more convenient or managing their calendars. Um, and it's not a great place to start, um, A, because, well, uh, think about who your competitors out, out, out there are, right? There's probably thousands of other undergrads hanging out in their dorm room as we speak, thinking to themselves, well, what is my pain, pain, pain point in life? I wish I had a way to, to date more easily. I wish I had a way to get that pizza here a little bit sooner, right? So you're picking, a business where there are thousands of people that are thinking about that business, that pain point at that specific moment. So if you're in that position, and I don't care that you're young, but go out and really fall in love with a market and a pain point where there's not so much competition. I always tell, tell people, go work, go explore, you don't have to work, but go explore what happens in gas stations. Go and explore what happens on, on farms. Go work in a pharmacy, right? Like look for pain points that are far from your limited small view of the world and you're absolutely in a great place to build a huge company i love that idea you know fall in love with the pain not not the tech or, or not what you want to build um okay well so john here we are now fast forward you're at the skydeck fund i mean you kind of built it right um what are your thoughts about entrepreneurs becoming investors. So, you know, you were a founder, a multi, uh, multi-time multi founder, um, and I have, you know, now running this fund. What are the strengths and weaknesses of an entrepreneur becoming an investor? I, I, I think, uh, so in, in my current role, I, I interact with basically all of the funds in the Valley. Um, and I've met hundreds of um, partners, if not more, and what I would say is that you can easily, you quickly see a divergence between two backgrounds. One is exactly the one that you just talked about, Aaron. These are our, our folks who've been a operator. Um, a lot of times they're founders. Sometimes um, in, in increasingly you, 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 you do see people that have a PM background from Google, right? They, they built products. They might not be experts in a startup, in a company for formation, but they are experts in product formation, right? And, and I'll put that in that category. The other category are folks who um, have a consulting background, who, who just completed their MBA, who haven't done, done much else. And, and, and they're here to analyze a business from, um, on the basis of their, of their financial projections and, and all of the, the, uh, the Garner reports, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I am a huge fan of the first class. I'm a huge fan of operators who, who have now gone on and, be, and um, become investors. Uh, I, I, now, this is part of because of where I play uh, in the staff, right? I'm, I'm mostly working with investing with early stage. Um, these are companies, uh, when, I, when I see them, they usually have almost a lot of them don't have revenue. I'm okay with that. Some of them have up to a million dollars in revenue. Um, but there's a certain class of problems that, that they face. And I think only if you are an operator, only if you've actually been in the trenches and had to deal with missing payroll and had to deal with losing your one only co-founder um, or your only customer, like there's a certain class of problems that those people will understand. 
And then you have um, the later stage, perhaps that's where the financial model based approach is, is going to really do, do fine, but I don't really play um, in, that, in, in that part of the world. Well, it's an interesting point that early stage venture capital, late stage venture capital, they're just not the same thing at all, right? You know, it's it's a exactly. whole different ball game uh, that requires very different skill sets, um, even if we call them both VC. Um, you know, well, so Chan, can you tell us more hey, about the Skydeck hey, fund? Aaron, like, yeah. Aaron, on, on that point, one, one more quick comment. Um, you know, I because we work very closely with Haas Business School at MBA um, at, at Berkeley, I have a lot of MBAs that are very intent on becoming VCs that come and ask me about for career advice. Um, and, and, and I actually tell, tell them that the first thing you should do is, you know, they usually come to me for, for, for advice on how to interview, right? How to manage the interview process, how do I build my case studies, et cetera. And I'm like, you're asking the wrong guy because I wasn't hired that way, right? I, I have no experience in how you interview. And I, I, but what I would, what I've always spoken consistently is, um, if you go down, go up that pathway, it's not an easy one, and you are you have a lot of peers. Why don't you go join an early stage startup? Go build, go build, build something, and then come back to it. All right, sorry. No, I, I, I love that advice. Like, if you want to teach someone how to do something, maybe you should get the experience necessary to teach it in the first place. Yeah. Well, so so tell us about the Skydeck Fund. What what is your thesis? What what are you trying to accomplish over there at at, at Cal? Yeah. You know, it's fun to talk about Skydeck before and, and after because I, I think that helps answer the question a, um, a little bit. Skydeck was built 2011, 2012 as a very traditional accelerator um, or incubator type program. And I think all of you have 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 come across those. I know there's more more than one at Davis as as well. Um, and it was just a safe space for students and faculty to really think about, to really explore the ideas, the 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 tech, the IP that they had built. Um, and we we think about it as, as a platform where talent goes in this way and then out comes a, a company, that's about right. Um, you meet advisors, you meet accountants, you meet attorneys, you, 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 you get advice on how to push your push your, yourself or your, your core idea a little bit forward. What it didn't have was a fund. Um, and the reason most of these accelerators don't have funds, in fact, I'd say almost all of them don't have funds, is because financial investors' capital is not really interested in this class of founding. Right, like, why would I want to constrain my money to be invested in only one small pool of companies? If we think about in, um, fund managers as being in competition with each other, and, and to a large degree, we 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 are we are competing for the deal flow or for capital. So if I can put my capital in um, a coastal ventures or a benchmark ventures that invest in everybody. Or I can put it in Chan's mind that only invest in one school. Well, which one do I think is going to do better, right? Like, what possible argument um, it, could there be to to constrain yourself to one small pool um, of of uh, possible talent? Um, so, what you ultimately end up getting are funds that are backed by alumni that want to give back, right? That's what these usually are, and that's what we expected for our fund. Um, I thought this would be a fun little side project. I thought that we would, we would we would go off and talk to the alums that were were paying for the football program, or that were buying, uh, that were in, in trying to build things on campus, and say, hey, why don't you give us some of that capital to invest in in, in, in uh, some companies like that? Uh, but uh, it was only about a couple months into that process that we had this inspiration, um, and and really, if you think about it from a startup perspective, it all makes sense. Like we went out, we talked to our customers and we, we realized what our competitive advantage was. And we're like, wait a minute, we should pivot. So we had to pivot um, into a new model for what this could, could, could be. Our thesis now is focus on a group of founders that we think are very high potential um, that are not from Berkeley, that are not affiliated to Berkeley in any way, that UC Berkeley is uniquely positioned to help 
to build their um, businesses. Uh, and I'm talking about, so, so people kind of go like, how's that possible? Like, who are these magical folks that only you are in a position to help? We're talking about startup founders from outside of the US, okay? Um, so roughly two thirds of the companies going through our program as, as we speak have no previous ties to, to uh, the UC. And in fact, th they have to have built their companies outside of, of the US. Um, and why this is, makes sense, six billion people, right? There's six billion people who aren't in the US, who aren't in China, who are brilliant, who are hardworking, who, who watch all of the, 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 you know, who read all the tweets, who watch all the videos. They know all there's to know about venture. Um, but in their home markets, they don't have access to the market or, or the capital that allows them to push that forward. They know the best place to do that remains here in the Bay Area, and they want to come, come. They want to come out here, but by virtue of their lack of connections here, it turns out that the Valley is not that friendly. I mean, it is friendly. Don't get me wrong, but capital is not that friendly. When they see a founding team consisting of, you know three PhDs from Eastern Europe, right? Or from Argentina. Um, it's very hard for investors in the Valley to, to, to get over that lack of knowledge. They, don't, they feel like they don't have any context on who these folks are. Are they the right ones to back? Skydeck is, is, is all about solving that problem for, for them. In the six months that they're here in Berkeley, um, pre and post COVID, we, we are, connecting them to um, to uh, amazing folks on, on campus. We help them complete their team with undergrad students and faculty. We also make sure that we um, help them on uh, biz dev, right? So uh, the, the key to raising venture is always gonna be having paid traction, right? Paid customers that prove traction and show that you've now found product market fit for your business. And what better way to do that than to utilize the 500,000 Cal alumni that we have, a lot of whom are in the, in the Bay Area. Most of them are more than happy to take a meeting with you to help understand how they can help, um, to help understand introductions that, they're, that, that they can make on your behalf and more. And by virtue of this amazing funnel that we have, we can, uh, we can attract amazing investors as well. We have 600 plus investors that come to our demo day. Um, I, I, I love this idea of a fund really understanding which problem it's trying to solve, just like it's telling its startups to do. You know, you're not just an, an entity with money. You know, you have to do so much more than that to be useful and helpful. Um, well, so Chan, I wanted to maybe a little more deeply into how you add value. You mentioned all these connections across the alumni network and the university, um, you know, you make these investments almost in cohorts. Can you tell us a little bit more about how like the nuts and bolts of the fund operates? And then maybe some detail about, you know, how you work with so many companies at the same time. Yeah. So how, how does it work? Um, we, we, we do this in two batches per year, two cohorts. Um, in this last cohort, for example, we had 1800 com companies apply uh, to, they, they submit their pitch deck, they submit a video in some cases and they answer some questions. We then have the um, rather challenging task of going through the 1800 pitch decks that we saw and, and try to bring that down to about 120 that we want to meet. Um, again, pre-COVID, this would be in, in person. Now, of course, it's all on Zoom. For the 120 companies that we meet, they have about 20 minutes to convince us that that this that their 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 dream is possible. Um, uh, we understand that we're really going to be the first check in to these 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 uh, companies. They haven't they haven't raised, so it's obviously early. It's obviously something where they've talked to other investors and gotten a whole lot of no's. That's just a fact of life. Now we're going to have to to kind of see past that that rough exterior and and kind of understand if, if the founders, if um, the market, uh, if the core competitive technology, if, if that's where their advantage comes from, if that's enough to bring them to the, to the next level. 
from 120, we'll, we will filter down to about 40 to 50 that we can spend a lot of time with. And not enough, to be honest, but we probably spend a couple of hours at least with each of the 40 and the 50. And after that, we end up with about 20 as it comes into our program. Um, once the 20 startups come into our program, the first two months, the first six, eight, six to eight weeks are incredibly in, intense. There is about three weeks of um, what we call BAM sessions. These are essentially classes that, that are taught, right? But they're not academic classes. These are taught by executives, these are taught by investors that are really just trying to get across the core knowledge of what you need. And, and I've talked to a lot of even third time founders who, who, who come back and said, man, these, these are really valuable things. They think about how you tell your story. They think about how you may handle your fundraise, how you go to market, um, et cetera. And then from week six through month six, it's all about building that company. It's all about utilizing everything available at Dave, um, at Berkeley in that ecosystem to find customers and, and push things forward. Uh, and then it culminates in a giant pitch day in front of a lot of investors. And then historically more than 50% of our companies will go on and raise um, from institutional investors. And now they're off. Awesome. Well, so, let let maybe dive in a little bit on the say those those forty that make it to the very last decision step, um, the ones that make it to the final twenty. What are they doing, or what are you seeing that convinces you? You know what? You're the one I want in the cohort. What 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 are some of the things that the superstars have in common? No. The easiest thing, the easiest ones, where we all, everyone at the table, kind of. Once the, the pitch is over, we, we, we have our feed, feedback session. And they're ones where we all kind of go and chuckle and say, well, that's an easy one. That's a, that's a, that's a slam dunk, is if you have lots of revenue, right? Um, especially when we're talking about the foreign startup that perhaps ha hasn't raised because they haven't been here. Um, but we, we know in, intuitively they're building an amazing product in a, in a great market. And guess what? They have lots of paying customers that is concrete proof that their product is in need in, in, in the market, that's an easy one. Um, I think the, the more interesting question and the one that we spend a lot of time on are the startups where it's not so, so, so obvious. It's easy in the process, they're, they're free revenue. So how do we distinguish the ones that are a PowerPoint but interesting from the ones that are a PowerPoint and not interesting? Um, and, and I think, you know, I hate to be so cliche these because I'm sure all of you have, have seen or heard um, things like this in the past, but it, it really does come, come down. Um, I'll say it comes down to two things that, that I want more than anything else. The first one is really the size of the market. Um, almost every startup that I've ever invested in ends up pivoting into a direction that's often drastically different from one that they, that they launched with, right? So if for all of you who are in love with a specific um, hammer, right? You have a specific idea that you wanna build. You have to understand that in two years and four years and five years, you can very likely be doing something different. Uh, so what you get from having a huge market is that even as you end up having to pivot, even as you ultimately realize that your current idea is not the best one, you have a lot of room, right? You can go from here to here to here to here. Um, whereas if you started off selling, you know, cosmetics to redheads, um, well, you know, if, if that doesn't work, what do you pivot into? That's a very niche market. It's not a very large one. The second thing that I really care a lot about is, is of course, team. Um, we are, we, we want people that have done extraordinary things. Um, we have people that, that can show their ability to lead, especially for, for the CEO. Um, for the, the most important task that a CEO has is to really sell. Um, obviously they have to sell to their customers. Um, they also have to sell to their investors, right? You, you, you have to, to captivate me, convince me of your vision and that you're, you're the one person 
um, of the hundreds that are probably pursuing this, this exact idea. You're the one that's going to win. But you also have to be able to sell to your employees. Right? I mean, I, sometimes we get these founders who look great on paper, but it's a single founder. And when, when we ask why, they say, oh, well, you know, I just couldn't convince any, anyone to, to come into my idea. Well, I, I, that raises a lot of questions in my mind. Right? Like if, if you need to um, outcompete Google, if, if you need to outpay Google for the kind of talent that you and Google both want, that you're not going to make it. Sell side, you really need to be able to con con convince um, top talent to join you to not take that job over from Google because you're going to lead them to the promised land. Right. Absolutely. Well, so, John, I'd love to hear just a couple of specific stories. Some of these companies you've invested in, I don't know, funny memories, just exciting times, teams that have done really cool, interesting things. Can you give us a few examples and, and maybe even some of the big successes, um, recognizing that, like you said at the beginning, you're more likely to fail than not. But, but what are some of, the, some of the rocket ships you've got to ride? Uh, yeah, so I mean, in terms of rock rocket ships, one of the fastest ones that we saw both go up and come down is Lime. Um, for all of you who 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 remember, it's it's uh, been a year since you've probably seen a Lime or been on a Lime, but but they used to be a big thing. So um, Lime was was founded 2017, perhaps, or maybe late 16, and it's an interesting story. It's an interesting story that probably not all of us are are gonna. Um, it, it's hard to compare because it's, it's not a found, founding experience that most of us will have ex exposure to. It was co-founded by Brad Bow, who is um, a VC actually for Tencent. Um, and he already seen the launch of, of scooters um, as um, a massive business of shared bikes as a massive business in China. And on behalf of Tencent and as well as some other investors that he was working with, he, he wanted to find something in, in the U.S. to invest in. He, was, he had, had the opinion that this was a market that was going to, to explode. He looked around and, and he decided that none of the teams that were starting to look in, in that space were very interesting to him. So he built his own. He, he, uh, both of them, um, uh, both Brad and to Toby Sun went to Haas at Berkeley. Um, and uh, that's how they met each other. And they said, let's build our own, 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 own company. They started with a pretty decent um, investment check. I, I believe in $5 million, $10 million on day one. Um, but we're talking about within the span of about three months, they had raised tens of millions. And then in six months, they raised 50 million plus. And then by probably nine to 12 months in, they were raising at a billion dollars plus um, and what was amazing was that I, I heard the story and I just said, are you kidding me? They raised at a billion um, back in May of probably 18, was it 19? I, I want to say it was 2018. And they were raising at 2 billion valuation. So they doubled in value in one month, yeah. right? Um, so that was a, a crazy and wacky time. And, and you know, th their challenges are very different from the challenges that the rest of us face. It's not about finding product market fit. It's just how do I deploy a billion dollars, <laughs> all right? How do I deploy a billion dollars and build an org and launch across 50 cities and make sure that our bikes aren't being stolen and, and make everything and our customers are, are unhappy. Now I mentioned the, that shit came crashing back, back down, of course, um, you know, even pre COVID, there were a lot of questions about that business model and it, it was sustainable. Um, well, some of the metrics were not looking very good then you went to COVID, basically all of the players um, ran out of cash at, at, at the same time. Um, they're pretty fortunate because they actually uh, got a bunch of cap cap capital from Uber and um, uh, they basically exited. I don't think the founders got a whole lot from that process. I think the investors all lost a, a lot of money, but at least the brand will live on and Brad and Toby are off to do their next, next cool, cool thing. Um, so that was a rocket ship. Um, a less rocket shippy company that I would love to tell, tell you guys a little bit about, I guess it's called Hum, H-U-M-M-M. -M -M. These were a bunch of Australians 
who had this crazy idea. They're building a headband that um, that stimulates your brain in order to improve memory. Okay, and, and for 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 those of you in school who find that interesting, go go online and go find out more about it. Um, but what I find compelling about, about them is that their ability to persist. When you're building a consumer hardware company, that's probably the toughest type of, of business possible. You don't have any proof that this thing works until you've raised millions of dollars and built it, right? It's not a software thing where you go on AWS and um, you write some code and, and now you, you, you're in business. That's not, that's not the way it works. Um, they went through our program, they pitched at demo day, and what they got in response was crickets. You know, the, these, these folks didn't come from Tencent. They didn't have that amazing background. Um, and no one wanted to invest um, millions of dollars in an unproven tech. So I think for a lot of founders, this would have been a very good time to walk away. In fact, two of the, co the four co-founders on the team did walk away, but two of them didn't. Two of them persisted and, and they wanted to pursue the stream and they kept going. They just kept um, building up proof. They kept de-risking as much as they possibly could. They kept pitching and pitching and pitching. They got a lot of no's, but then they found they got a yes and they end up raising $3 million. Their product is, is now, uh, their beta is, is now live. Um, and uh, this is a company that, that I, I honestly was prepared to, to um, right off uh, two years ago, but now they, they seem like they're going in the right direction. I, I love those stories, John. Well, we are at 155. Um, promise to give you a hard stop at two. So let's let's wrap up here, give Chan a round of applause and thank him for his time. We'll wrap up there then. Chan, thank you so much for your time. This was extremely helpful. Um, appreciate you calling in from across the planet and, and for your insight and advice. Um, I hope all our students take it to heart and, and hopefully we'll have a handful uh, ready for your Skydeck program in no time. So um, go Aggies. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Awesome. John, thank you again. Take care, everybody. Hey, guys.